questions until the end of the session so that we can make sure we get to as many as possible without interrupting the flow of the presenter's information. We will try to get to as many as we can. If we cannot get to everything, we will follow up with you as soon as possible. And also, we really love your feedback. At the end of this session, you'll receive a Qualtrics survey link. They have been working interestingly in that some people have had the opportunity to just click the link and it immediately opens up in the survey. What I've noticed with my own links is that I have to copy it and paste it into a separate browser window. But we really hope you'll take a few minutes to fill out your survey because it's great feedback for the presenters and it also helps us continuously improve for our future conferences. So we appreciate your support. Next slide, please. All of the um, Arizona State University, Northern Arizona University, and the University of Arizona all acknowledge in slightly different ways that they occupy land and territories of indigenous people. We've included each institution's land acknowledgement on this slide for your education and awareness. So please feel free to read it if you have not already seen it today. Now let's meet our panel. Barbara Shea is a Research Advancement Administrator Senior for the Department of Psychology at Arizona State University. She earned a BA from Brandeis University, an MBA from Boston University, and has more than eight years of experience in pre-award research administration, assisting researchers in developing and submitting proposals to a wide range of federal, not-for-profit, corporate, and state sponsors. Barbara enjoys the challenges of staying current with the ever-changing landscape of sponsor requirements, which we know is every five seconds, maneuvering through submission portals, and working with her post-award colleagues to ensure seamless transition from proposal to award. Barbara hails from the greater Boston area and has called Arizona home since 1995. When she's not working, you might find her at a local coffee shop searching for that perfect cup. Megan Dirksen recently joined the University of Arizona College of Medicine, Phoenix, as a research proposal manager. As of today, she has been there for two months, and she asked me to warn you that all of her training grant experiences so far have been at other universities, including ASU. Megan's pre-award research administration experience spans 12 years in four universities with expertise in handling health sciences and engineering proposals and sponsors. This includes teaching engineering faculty how to submit their very first NIH training grant, which I know from conversations we've had that was a very fun experience. Nancy Osgood has been in the ASU research advancement community since the fall of 2006 in various pre and post award roles in the Fulton Schools of Engineering and the College of Health Solutions. Currently, as a pre-award manager in the College of Health Solutions, she's responsible for submitting large strategic proposals along with onboarding new research faculty and setting up their incoming grants. She and her husband have just started RVing and are looking forward to their first grandchild this summer. Congratulations. And now I will turn the presentation over to Barbara. Okay, I'm having some issues um, getting to the right slide, but here we are. Okay, so um, the first thing I want to do is to ask everybody to raise your hand in uh, the Zoom, if you can, if you've ever worked on submitting a T32 proposal. And I'm not including myself in this one. You should have a raise hand in your reactions at the bottom one. of the screen. Yep. <laughs> Okay. One, oh, good, two. Okay, so I see three, four. four. Okay, yeah. so maybe more than just the panel. That's re that's really great. Um, the the purpose of of, of today's uh, session is to really help you do three key things. So just to gain the over an, an understanding of the construction and components of these types of grants, learn how they differ from standard research proposals, such as, for example, an R01 and how to try to organize them for a smooth and what we call unchaotic submission process, which really doesn't happen. Um, the other thing we wanna do is make sure that, that RAs, that the RA community in the tri-university um, RA community has resources in case you end up working on these grants or is something that your department is considering, and to really outline some of the challenges and unique features associated with these mechanisms. Um, Nancy, Megan, myself, 
we all have, I think, a, a relatively strong collective background and experience and some knowledge in, in providing guidance that might help RAs mitigate some of the large amount of stress and anxiety that comes from working on these complex projects. Um, and we can also provide some tips to managing training grant proposal development, working through some things in the submission process and making workflow manageable from start to finish. These grants are highly competitive and awards are prestigious, not only for the institution, but for the PI. But they do come with a lot of associated anxiety. And a lot of that is related to the vast amount of information that needs to be collected prior to submission. So in short, I know that was not short, but in short, we want to make this more of a, you know, what worked for us session as opposed to these are the mechanics of submitting a T32 proposal, because you will have many long days and nights working on those mechanics. Um, but if you do have issues on those types of mechanics, we can also help you with that as well. So uh, on this slide, um, what are the institutional grants? largely uh, DHHS, Department of Health and Human Services. They have quite a vast array of grants or training grants. And DHHS, as some of us know, includes the FDA, CDC, NIH, um, ARC, and HRSA. And what, you know, what we have found was that all across the spectrum, you can find funding for trainees, whether they be graduate, undergrad or even postdoc. And, um, you know, ASU has a T32 they've had for decades and it's been very successful. It's put through uh, many, many students. And like Barbara was saying, they're just very prestigious for the, for the PI, the university, but of course, ultimately it, it provides funding for the student. And that's, that's a very good thing. Um, they help in mentorship and support diversity and equity, which is, you know, a huge need right now. And uh, the primary ones that we're, again, looking at today will be the NIH T32 grant and then the HRSA training grants. And, um, you know, this is really important for ASU because we, we kind of realized recently that we're, we're on a big push to build our portfolio in this area, but there aren't just very many uh, research administrators like myself and Barbara who, who uh, know how to put these together. So we're hoping today it encourages other RAs to, to you know, band together, come uh, to us if you need help. And we're also seeing an increase in PIs looking at these uh, different funding opportunities to help build out that portfolio. Okay, thanks, Nancy. Um, so this part of the presentation is gonna focus on the T32 part. So the program purpose, which is of course hyperlinked there, is to enable the institution to recruit individuals for specified shortage areas that require additional research training. So the goal of the program is to prepare you know, qualified pre-docs and postdoctoral trainees for careers that have that significant impact on the health-related re research needs of the nation. And there are, as Nancy just said, there are many funding opportunity announcements available. They tend to will vary depending um, on goals, topic areas, and um, level of trainees supported and duration of support. Of course, there are always hyperlinks to those areas. So Nancy did mention the Department of Psychology's T32. We have had that grant since um, 1987, okay? Mm -hmm. And it was led by the same PI for more than 30 years. And it was originally issued by NIMH, but it is now under NIDA. So needs change, program direction uh, changes as well. We also, our grant also um, has trained well over 100 people over the years, um, which has made a significant impact on the, um, on the workforce. Um, in general, across the nation, there are about 1,500 active T32s. The average, um, the total funding is about a 550 million and the average funding, okay, for each grant is only at about 363,000. Mm -hmm. So as you will learn, these are truly a labor of love, a, 
uh, as on the institutional side, on the PI side, and all the preceptors who do a lot of this work for not a lot of great financial return, but very large impact. Um, so the list that you see here is not a full checklist for all of the different components that you're going to need to complete a T32 proposal. Um, instead, we're focusing on a few key pieces that make these proposals different from your more standard NIH R1 or R21. So for the budget, um, a key thing to keep in mind is that the total award amount you'll receive is actually quite small compared to the amount of work that you put into it, both at the proposal side and during the award. Um, this section will also be finalized a little faster than what you may used to because a lot of it is, is pretty prescripted. Um, Barbara's going to get into a little bit more of the budget details in a couple of minutes. Um, some other unique T32 components are the data tables. The fact that you will have anywhere from 25 to sometimes 50 plus additional faculty, um, depending on, on your, your PI or your program, they're uh, either called preceptors or research mentors. Um, then, and these people are also involved in the project, um, highly involved in the project. Your research strategy, which for a T32 is called the program plan, has a max limit of 25 pages. And then you can expect a whole list of other supplementary docs that you've never encountered before um, to be then to be required here. And they can kind of vary depending on your specific funding announcement. Um, as the research administrator, you can expect a large majority of your time to be spent on the data tables and then sending a million different email reminders to all of your research <laughs> mentors and everybody else that you're working with to put together these components. You can go to the next slide. Um, so this is a list of items that typically can have a little more flexibility for change if you're working on a standard grant, um, but they have massive ripple effects in a T32 proposal. Um, if your PI is new to training grants, um, they'll often need our help to understand that a last minute change in one of these areas can mean having to redo or up pages um, or update pages upon pages of proposal documents. Our suggestion is to focus on confirming these three things right away um, when you start meeting with your PI. So first off is the list of participating apartments. Um, any changes in this list are going to affect your data tables, especially the enrollment related tables. The key item to focus on here is that by definition, your list of participating departments must represent the different grad programs at your institution that are going to recruit and enroll trainees and not just list out every single home department of all of the research mentors that are on your team. Um, be prepared to potentially have a lot of arguments about this. Um, it was a huge back and forth issue in the most recent T32 that I submitted. Um, second on the list is confirming who your trainees are actually going to be. Um, your choices here are pre-doctoral st students only, postdocs only, or a mix of both. Um, any changes here are going to affect your budget, as well as the list of specific data tables that you're going to complete for the proposal. Um, and another key item to note here is that NIH requires that any trainee must be a U.S. citizen, non-citizen, national, or permanent resident. And lastly, if your PI or if you value your sleep at all, you want to finalize your list of research mentors early and get everyone to stick to it the best you can. Um, changes here are going to affect everything from your data tables to the program plan all over the place. Um, you will inevitably have to remo uh, remove a few mentors from your list because they don't send you their files on time. And that's really OK. <laughs> There's always a few. Um, there's always a few that you have to cut, and there's always a few that find out how much information is required of them, and then tell you that they no longer want to be part of the proposal. Um, so next slide. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the budget component, which, as Megan said, is actually entirely prescribed by the sponsor. And the budget format pages, which I'll show you in a second, look entirely different than most. Um, budgets you've seen uh, for these types of um, activities. Um, so the budgets may only include these items, stipends, which are a flat 
annual rate for your pre-docs and for post-docs. It is prescribed by NIH, but just varies according to years of experience. Tuition and fees, up to 60% of actual tuition and only up to certain dollar amounts a year, depending upon the type of um, trainee. Uh, trainee travel is always included, but the amounts actually vary by the institute or center. So check your table of IC requirements and specific information to see what they allow for you to include in your budget. Um, training related expenses is again prescribed at two rates, one for pre-docs, one for post-docs. This is, um, now TRE as we call it, can go toward things like trainee health insurance, guest speaker fees, consultant costs, staff travel, PI effort. It's really up to the discretion of the awardee, but the thing to know and to remember is this line item must cover expenses that are directly related to train, directly related to training. So it, it all depends on how much money you plan on spending on health insurance, how much you have want in your budget to cover those things like those guest speakers. And sometimes it's a situation of trade-offs. If a PI wants to add time, their time has to come out of those training related expenses, okay? Um, and also, you know, consortium training costs, if applicable, I haven't had any experience with that. So at this point, um, that has been a, a zero. Uh, indirect costs are the training rate of 8% of modified total direct costs. So of course, tuition and fees are excluded and are typically shown as participant support. Um, the thing to, okay, I'm just gonna go to the next slide, which, ah, I mean, here, well, here are a couple of considerations first. The two primary considerations for budget buildings are really how many slots a year, and that's what they call the number of appointees um, for, for whatever level of, of training you're dealing with. For postdocs, you need to, to know how many years each postdoc will be in the training program because that will change their stipend level on an annual basis. And then you need to determine the levels for each one. Um, we try to recommend that you somewhat aggressively budget postdocs when you were doing that because you don't want to underestimate because that might result in a stipend shortfall. Okay, so this is an example of year one of the submitted budget that psychology submitted back in September of 2020, um, uh, I think for, um, for our current funded renewal. So all the rates have changed since then, but this is the only information that is requested. It's the, the sum total of, we had three pre-docs as you can see. So the sum total of the requested stipends the sum total of the postdoctoral stipends at three levels in here, we were requesting three of those appointees as well. Trainee travel, that was a flat rate, um, $1,000 prescribed by the IC at the time, and then training related expenses at the rates they were at back a few years ago. Those change every year according to NIH notices. And then, um, you know, indirects off of 8% of MDTC. Okay, I'm going to skip through the next couple of slides because they're just basically repeating um, in the fit. Well, okay, yeah, this is the, um, okay, for, for this slide, you just want to look, if you look at where the postdocs are, we have postdocs starting off at years, two years of experience, three years, and then four. Okay, and then the final slide is just on this budget is just the sum total. I'm sorry, I apologize, it's very hard to read. Um, another couple of another tips and tricks or best practices, because the budgets are so um, prescribed, they don't give a lot of detail here. It's always good to have as many um, sub spreadsheets as you need to really um, um, retain all the detail on how many trainees you have in each slot, what is the individual um, TRE associated with each trainee, uh, what are the travel costs, where you want that TRE to go. You might have calculations over in the overall to really break it down. The, as, we're, as we're all going to say, 
keep the records that best fit your needs, but the more detail you have, the better should the award be granted that your post-award team can really um, make sure that the budget matches what was submitted. Um, so this list represents the required data tables for a new or a renewal revision T32. Um, if you happen to be submitting a training proposal that's for undergraduates, which is a T34, um, or for an international program, there's a different list. Um, NIH has a website that breaks down all of the different requirements for each possible proposal option and also includes their templates and like giant pages of instructions. Um, we provide a, a link at the end of our slides that you can go back to later. Um, I'm going to show you what some of these tables look like. Uh, using the examples that NIH prints in their instructions. Um, for today, we're going to focus on the four that are highlighted because they often cause the most trouble. You can go, yep. Um, so first off, we have a list of additional awarded federal institutional training grants at your institution. Um, note that the example only, here only lists NIH training grants. Um, but the instructions require you to list all federal training awards, which means that there are some things like an NSF STEM award that also count and, and do get put on this list. Um, you're also not listing every single qualifying award that's at your university. You're just listing the ones that have crossover between your list of faculty, um, which often is not a very easy thing to look up. Um, Table four is the closest thing that you're going to find to another support or a current and pending support list. Um, there are a lot of additional rules that make this one different. One key thing to note is that you need to list the current year direct costs, not the total award amount or the total direct cost. Um, this, again, is also not going to probably not going to be as easy to look up as you might think. At least I know it's not in ASU's grant systems. I've heard rumors it's not so great in, in, to find in U of A's as well. Um, so for, yep. Uh, table 6A, this is the enrollment related table that I referred to earlier. Um, so here I'm only showing you one year's worth of info, but note that you need to include the past five years of applicant data in your actual full completed table. Um, I want to look we're going to look at how clear and, and nice and pretty this NIH example is. In the next couple slides, I'm going to show you the reality of, of what we submitted on the last one that I worked with. So this is part one of the table. Um, it doesn't look too scary, but then we go to the next slide. All of these next so slides are part two of the table that was a little bit ago. Um, you will see that, okay. Um, you'll see one section um, in the slide back before this where it turns out that the school that we were working with didn't actually collect the information that we needed to list in the table. Um, so we had to inform them, well, well, we'll start doing it later if you give us the award. Um, <laughs> after that, the next couple slides are just showing you how long, and there's actually another full um, full page that I skipped and didn't include on the slides. Mm -hmm. We had page after page of just listing the prior institutions that the applicants came from. Um, so you like point is, this gets really, really long. Um, and again, if you think about it, it's it's what I've just shown here times five. And if you happen to be submitting a T32 that includes both pre- and postdoctoral trainees, you double that again because you're including both of the sets of tables. Next one. So for table 8A, it's actually um, table 8A part three is the only piece for a new award that you need to include. Um, this is basically a, a where are they now sort of list of the most recent graduates for the past five years that all of your different research mentors have worked with. So this is one of those pieces where you are um, getting your list of like working with your mentors to try to gather all of their information and then put it all together. Um, this is also one piece where the citizenship rule comes into play. Uh, when you sit down, you read the full instructions from NIH, it's going to state that the only students that you can list in these tables 
are those that would be would have been eligible for your proposed program if it had been available when they were in school. So that means basically that you're only listing you as citizens and permanent residents on these tables. Um, for my proposal that came out of the engineering school, we had many faculty that had years of extensive mentoring ex uh, experience, but because such a large majority of the PhD students out of engineering are foreign students, they had to list none for this table. That even include two of the MPIs on the proposal, and they had to figure out how to talk about their experience and, you know, and the needs of the proposal when they had listed none on the table. So next slide. Um, so now that we have scared you into hoping you never, ever, ever get assigned to a training proposal, we are going to focus a little more on where to get the help. So as you get started, you're going to want to think of who the key players are that you'll need to pull everything together, um, who holds the applicant enrollment data in your participating departments that you need to list in those tables that we just clicked through. Um, expect a lot of inconsistencies here. Uh, because the three of us all relatively recently had to complete the exact same tables for three different proposals, and we all ended up having to work with different departments and different staff in order to find the information that we needed. Um, in the engineering dean's office, there was a data management team, but they weren't very used to research data, and so I had to sit down and work extensively with them. Um, Barbara had a graduate coordinator that was really helpful for having that data, and I think Nancy has worked with a whole mix of people, uh, including the institutional level data analytics office. Um, you also want to pay attention to the lead time that's required for things like your institutional support letters and tuition coverage um, at each institution, um, because that often changes and can be, you know, um, something you need to warn your PIs about. Uh, but most importantly is who can help you survive this? How are you going to get through this and get everything in on time? Um, can you talk your PI's department into lending you a student worker to help with the data table entry when you get when you have everything you need and you just have to get it all combined together? Um, I was lucky enough, totally lucky in my very first training proposal that I had a PI who not only had a project coordinator that was available to help um, and who also like in her role, she had access to student demographic data, which which helped a ton. Um, but the PI herself rolled up her sleeves and she completed a couple of the tables on her own. Um, she knew her team well enough that she was really able to take the lead on the, the table that lists like other institutional grants at the institution. Um, but in my most recent T32, the PIs barely wanted to talk about the tables because they thought that's Megan's job. Um, she just does the whole thing. We don't have to worry about it. Um, I'm going to tell you that's not the case, <laughs> but um, there's, you know, there's no way one person or an RA can, can go hunting and complete all of that on their own. Um, but it definitely was a contrast between, you know, how I went about things on the two different proposals. Um, there's also no shame whatsoever in asking your peers if they have templates that you can use or advice to share, um, depending on your proposal management system at the university. Sometimes you can go in and look up other proposals that have been submitted and take take a look on your own at what people have done. Um, do you know anyone at all that submitted a training grant before? Uh, because if you didn't a half an hour ago, you know through people now that you can reach out to for help. So next, yep. You're on mute, Barbara. Sorry, do we have time for one quick anecdote? I think- um, Sure, go for it. Okay, great. I mean, the key point is keep it organized, but try to, you again, you have to develop your own process for doing that. Like, I'm just gonna give one example of something that seems sort of benign for an NIH proposal, but it ends up being a real bear to manage when you're working on these things. And that is the bio sketch, okay? So in the most recent proposal we submitted, we have 55 or 56 preceptors and, um, and also all the faculty members numbered that. So that came out to be 274 pages of bio sketches, okay? 
And that's really about half of the proposal, at least um, volume in terms of number of pages. So, so the thing to re remember is, I guess, you really need to figure out what is your strategy towards requesting these documents, collecting them, recording them, putting them in the correct order once the full complement is ready. Is it how the, does the PI want it a certain way? You know, how, do, how it best fits the needs of that proposal. And the things to remember are that, um, well, at least in our case, I think we were fortunate, our, one of the uh, multiple PIs did develop um, an abstract, which I, help, I helped send to all of the preceptors in that request that they could use as the personal statement. So that was consistent across the board for all of the bio sketches. And that was also, um, uh, that was before the transition to the new biosketch form, but as we all know, biosketches always need a review and update. And even if you do one of these proposals, say to next May's deadline, and you send the correct blank template, you're still going to get biosketches back in the format from 2014. <laughs> okay, that's just the way it goes. So don't be afraid to request updates, corrected information from the preceptors and mentors. You just you just really have to do it. It's still surprising how many people just use really outdated forms, no matter how many times we've said, no, this is the only form that the sponsor will accept. Um, okay, that, that is my one example, but we all have many more in, in our various experience. Mm -hmm. um, so another piece that, um, it's another way that I was pretty lucky, honestly, in the, the first ever NIH training proposal that I submitted, um, which was an undergrad T32. Um, I was lucky that that one was a resubmission. So the, the RA that had come before me, who had made a data table template for each mentor to complete that only included the information for the tables that were relevant to them, um, samples to complete and fill in. They had one document to, to go through and send back. Uh, it removed all of the rest of the unnecessary info. Um, since then, that first template gets adapted repeatedly. Uh, I am always trying to find the, the balance between including enough instructions on this file to stay ahead of the common mistakes that people tend to make when they send their info back. And we have to do that, you know, back and forth that Barbara was just talking about, um, but also not including so much detail that nobody reads it and just makes up what they think that they need to say. Um, it's going to forever be a work in progress, but I, I lean on that template file and the emails that go with it a ton. Um, so then lastly, we just have a list of resources and links that you can refer back to once the presentation slides are posted later on. And now I am going to hand the presentation over to Nancy, to Nancy, and she's gonna talk about her cigarettes. All right, well, thank you, ladies. Um, HRSA is a uh, sub-agency of DHHS, like I mentioned earlier, it's the Health Resources and Services Administration. And in the last several years, I guess since about 2018, uh, College of Health Solutions has been winning these. We've won at least three so far, and we're always going for more. And it's been interesting to me because they do offer a huge variety of training grants um, but also, I had no idea that they also provide here, as you can see their mission, they support people who do need health care, um, but as well as um, they offered just such a varied uh, um, type of, of uh, training grants, and I'll, I'll get into it a little bit more here, too. Here are some incredible numbers. Um, 30 million people served in underserved communities, uh, 58 million of pregnant women, infant and children, 576,000 with HIV, and they also focus a lot on rural community health. At HRSA.gov, I invite you to look there. They do this through three different ways, basically. They have over 90 different programs that provide health care to people um, who are most in need and economically medically challenged they have uh they provide funding to faith-based 
university, private nonprofit, um, all sorts of um, uh, awardees. And then here every year, HRSA serves tens of millions, like I mentioned, uh, very much in need. Drilling, I, I don't expect you to read these numbers, but I was just taken aback at, at how much uh, they do focus on the healthcare workforce. I had no idea. And, you know, 20,000 clinicians even received scholarship or got loan repayment, for example. Um, they provide uh, training, 34,000 in racial, ethnic, economic backgrounds, underrepresented, uh, 7,000 in mental health and substance abuse disorder, a uh, big area of need right now. 13,000 community health care workers were provided training and uh, expanded access to new programs that they've developed. And we won one, very surprisingly to us. We did win one this uh, last summer for um, training health workers already out in the field. So we fell in this category here, the 13,000, on and on as you can see. And this, this is by no means a complete list of how much funding they provide for people already in the healthcare workforce. So as I mentioned, we've had three so far and I'm optimistic about a few more. Um, and, and the variety that HRSA will fund is interesting because it's, it's not just like the T32 or T34 where you're gonna be just the only undergrads or only uh, pre-doc, right? They have such a variety of programs that our first one we won in 2018 uh, focused on training uh, six uh, master's level students and it provided them specific training in addition to their master's level already and uh, very much geared toward maternal health and child uh, wellness. And they have these main bureaus, these main areas within uh, you know, workforce development that they focus on. So we won one there. I think those folks got about $12,000 each a year plus uh, travel and um, some other things. Then the other one we won is the health, uh, Bureau of Health Workforce. In social work, I believe this was Bill Riley um, uh, 18 months ago on this for social work. Uh, he is uh, augmenting the training of 29 master's level students. They'll get a, a stipend in addition to some other goodies. And then um, this last one here is the one I mentioned about the community service workers that we will support uh, workers already out in the field. We have a lot of community partnerships at the Health College of Health Solutions. So um, we're going to augment their training into certain areas as well. So it's been a, a real exciting uh, sponsor for us. Um, NIH gets tough at times. And so um, it's nice to kind of start developing some momentum in a different area to build your portfolio. Like I mentioned uh, on their website right up front, they have tons of uh, training and assistance that they they publish online, but also on their website, they have their bureaus, their main focus areas of training need that they provide. And again, our two big ones have been the, the BHW and for health, the Bureau of Health Workforce, and then maternal and child health uh, care. And to find opportunities, of course, uh, grants.gov is always a good resource. If you're not familiar with it yet, um, here's a look at it, grants.gov. You can put in oppor oh, sorry, opportunity numbers in there. And I just put in HRSA here at the top and got a list. Uh, you know, some times of year it's, it's, it's kind of slim pickings. Other times there's a lot going on that they offer. Also within the HRSA website, they have their own um, uh, funding um, uh, opportunity list that you can sort through. This is a slide I got from uh, a HRSA presentation. Uh, and, I, and I laugh, I mean, 
it's interesting how they see themselves, right? That, oh, training grants and uh, do just have these four main areas. Well, you know, that's true. And they certainly are nothing like the T32. I mean, th these, the structure of these two types of training grants really couldn't be more opposite in so many different ways. Uh, but these are the basic four areas of, of uh, the proposal that you'll be working on. I, I certainly don't see it as simple as this, and I'll and I'll show you NSF here. They have their own SF424 guide too, just like uh, NIH does. With you know, there's an R version, there's an M for multi uh, projects, and an F for fellowships. So they do have their own guidance as well. They must be submitted through grants.gov. Um, ASU has a proprietary portal that does go system to system. So we, for the most part, most of ours can go in our proprietary. I know other institutions, you guys just use assist or grants.gov and, and you'll just continue to do that as well. They offer technical assistance webinars as well, um, which can be kind of helpful and then not so helpful, but they will have some FAQs that uh, I would really encourage you folks to, to always check out and they do update them as the questions come in. So here's just a very general list of the requirements, documents required, and they vary a little bit with each different funding opportunity, but basically they're, they're the same. They have a new template, the standardized work plan, a budget narrative, of course, a project narrative, bio sketch, and then a whole bunch of attachments. And they get attached separately, attachment one, attachment two, three. And as you can see here, they'll, they most always want a logic model and then a staffing plan and then all your letters of agreements with your partners, then um, an org chart. This particular one wanted experiential training site. That's kind of unique to, to a certain funding opportunity that we did. Uh, maintenance of effort, which I'll explain in a minute. Sometimes they want a sample of the student commitment letter and then the document of accreditation for your institution. Um, and then letters of support from, um, you know, consultants or external collaborators. So the, the, the nuance here about these HRSA grants is that they cap the documents either at 70, 75, or 80, at least the, the ones I've found. And that has to include basically all of these docs listed here. So that's interesting because the problem is you don't really know yet how many bio sketches you're going to need, right? And they only limit it to two bios. So you also don't know how many letters of agreements yet because your PI may not have solidified all the partnerships in the community that uh, he'd like to uh, embrace. So basically how this works is you're gonna have your total docs, let's just say 75 is what the FOA limited you to. Then you have to back out all the ones here that you're needing. And what that does is it's gonna tell you how much you've got left for the project narrative. Well, how does that work, right? It's, uh, it's a little strange. So what's our experience has been that it takes several weeks before you really know how many documents, your page limits are gonna be for your documents. So what, what we've done is we create a checklist, of course, and we put it in Excel. And usually within a few weeks, um, I don't know, one, two, three weeks, the PIs by then have been able to solidify who their partners are, you know, ideally the sooner the better. And so we know, okay, we're gonna have four uh, community partners. And so there's uh, four letters, right? And so we start backloading it in, right? We'll fill in um, the docs that we know are coming in. And so then we have to subtract it out. I know that like the ASU accreditation, for example, is two pages. Uh, the provost office asked that we submit these two accreditations that took two pages. So uh, basically I'm backing in to how much is left for the, for the scientific, for the training, excuse me, the training grant itself. 
So in this case, it uh, wasn't too bad that they had, uh, well, they had 50 pages of required. That left them with 25 pages to write their training plan. So another one had, they lucked out, they were able to get 35 pages to write their whole training plan. And the thing is, you just can't start in the beginning like you would a typical, you know, R01 with, all right, you got five pages per bio and 12 pages for your strategy. It's it's not as clean cut. So you just have to kind of um, kind of wait that out. The other thing I want to mention about how different these budgets are is like the T's, they are going to have the 8% F&A rate for uh, modified total direct costs. It's pretty common across training grants and DHHS. The other thing that I've had to kind of switch my thinking about is the, um, the number that they give us in the FOA, the funding opportunity announcement is a total number, right? So if it says, you'll get a million dollars a year for five years, it is not direct. And so I know having spent you know, eight years in engineering, I'm so used to that total. But then when I come over to here, the NIH world, everything is direct. No, nope, you got to kind of go back to the full. You're always working that full number again. So just be careful when you set up your budgets that you're always including that 8% um, as your number and, and it's a total amount. HRSA also uses the word stipend for the trainees. And they consider that to be a participant support cost. And they make you put it in that particular category as a participant, which means no FNA. And um, frankly, it's not, you know, their budgets are not that big, but it we have historically been able to give about ten to twelve thousand dollars a year stipend to each of the students. We can go to grad college and get some of the tuition waived, and we can also get some um, some travel dollars for them because they do like them to go to conferences. So, you know, it works a little bit differently again with the the PhD student that we're used to doing, and then you have that tuition remission calculation. They're not quite as formulaic as that, but um, the PIs have found a lot of success with these in, in, in students will want money any which way they can get. So um, that is participant support. And then the other bullet is that most often they want of your whole budget, say it is a million dollars a year, they expect you to spend 60% of that uh, $600,000 on stipends. They don't want it going to, you know, really much else. It, it, like, like Barbara said in the beginning, training grant, grants are a total labor of love for everyone involved, including, you know, post-award folks, pre-award, they really are, but they are so beneficial to students. And so we, you know, we just can't really not look at trying to win these. Maintenance of effort was a kind of a funny concept that took me a while to figure out, and I'd ask my central office about it. And finally, I realized that HRSA, if you have other grants that you're working on that are similar, but they're not federal funding, they don't want you to stop those expenditures. I, it, it's kind of an odd thing, but we have found that um, we do maintenance of effort, since we don't have anything similar already, we put in zero dollars. And unfortunately, that it, that costs you a page, one whole page. They have a little chart. They want you to put it on and, um, you know, just don't get thrown by that language. So I think that's all I had. And uh, we'll open it up to questions or if, Vicki, is there anything in the chat at this time? I mean, we're by no means experts, but there aren't a lot of us who know how to do these. So we, the three of us have learned so much from each other and um, just know you're not alone in these because because they can be a little bit overwhelming. It's a, it's a different animal for sure, these training grants. Thank you yes. so much, everybody. We're the last but not the least, right? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent presentation, ladies, as always, lots of useful information on a kind of scary topic. Um, I suspect nobody really thought that 
data tables gives them joy. But, you know, I thought I'd throw that out there just in case Too that it wasn't just me who wants to scream and rip the hair out of my head. Yeah. Are there any questions in the chat? Does anyone have questions? So far, everyone's just saying thank you and how wonderful the presentation was, which is great. Oh, awesome. Well, enjoy the rest of uh, your week. So, Thanks, everybody. And please don't forget to do your survey. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.